So uh, <clears throat> homeostasis. Homeostasis uh, can be thought of as like one of the very foundational concepts in, in physiology. Um, and this is the, the idea that all of your body's organ systems are, are working together uh, to maintain some sort of a stable internal environment. All right. Um, it was first uh, proposed by this guy, Walter Cannon, in the uh, early 20th century. So uh, there's this idea that whatever the state of the body is that we're considering, that it's going to fluctuate. It's going to be in flux. Uh, so there's some sort of dynamic equilibrium. An equilibrium is a forward and back reaction and that it's in this dynamic state, right? Sort of like uh, I have this picture of uh, some guy sitting here looking like a rock uh, on this ball, but honestly, he's <coughs> negotiating that somehow. Or likewise, uh, this woman uh, who looks solid as a rock, but she's, do she's doing a headstand on um, a paddleboard, which is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, and so there's the illusion of stability there, but she is... Her body is in flux, right? She's somehow navigating uh, that. And these are sort of um, not just metaphors uh, for homeostasis. There is some sort of a, a balance even in that. In that. Um, so more concretely, and we'll, we'll find out in the next slide what this even means, uh, this idea of negative feedback keeps some sort of variable near its set point, and we'll see what that means, okay? Um, if in any instance you lose homeostatic control of some system, some variable uh, in the body, that is going to result in some sort of illness or even potentially death, depending on what it is, okay? So let's, let's see that in more detail. Um, here are... This is like stripped down. Uh, here are the elements of a, a homeostatic system. In, this is very abstract. All right, I'm going to get more concrete with it in a bit. But there's some sort of variable that's getting regulated. Um, and this can be a number of things. We're going to go through what some examples of that. But uh, one of the examples <laughs> I'm going to use is temperature, body temperature. Uh, so that's a variable that's getting controlled. Uh, by the body. And there's a set point that that variable is going to get compared to. All right. So this is the temperature your body wants to be at 94.8 or something like that. Um, 96.8. I don't know what it is. But <clears throat> there's some sort of set point that this variable is going to get compared to that's fluctuating up and down. Um, there are going to be effectors, and there can be a number of effectors. Effectors have an effect, all right? They cause an effect. That's what an effector is. It's going to cause an effect on the variable, all right? Uh, and specifically what those effectors are, again, so this is general, uh, are going to be dependent upon the system that we're, uh, the homeostatic system that we're considering. So there um, are two different processes. There's negative feedback, which we're going to talk about first, and then uh, we're going to talk about some positive feedback. These are two different things. So a negative feedback is a type of homeostasis where the process of homeostasis is going to prevent change. It's going to prevent change, keep us within a narrow range of some set point. Whereas uh, positive feedback systems happen in isolated uh, instances where we need rapid change in the body. Okay, sometimes your body needs to change rapidly uh, for one reason or the other. And we'll, again, this will be less abstract in a bit. Uh, this is, and, and you will see why this is positive feedback. Um, so here are, uh, here's the general flow. We have some regulated variable down there in the corner, um, 
and there's going to be some kind of sensor that's monitoring that variable. That sensor, that sensory system, that monitoring system in the body is going to send the information that it's gathered to some kind of in integration center. That integration center is going to compare the incoming information about the regulated variable. It's going to compare it to a set point. All right. And then it's going to make a decision on what to do based upon that comparison. And so it's going to have, uh, it's going to have some output uh, to the appropriate effector. Uh, a negative, in negative feedback, that effector is going to oppose the change uh, that is being observed in the, regula uh, in the regulated variable. In positive feedback systems, that effector is going to speed up whatever change has been noted in the regulated variable. Okay, um, feed forward control. I left this in because maybe we'll get a chance to talk about this, although the speed this class has been going, I'm, I'm kind of downing it, but maybe when we get to talk about the brain more. Um, feed forward control is uh, a sort of a nuance that uh, can get added to a homeostatic system. So it's an external stimulus that's external to this loop of control that we're talking about that can uh, affect or alter uh, the outcome of that feedback response. So for example, um, uh, the one I have here is the anticipatory heartbeat uh, thing. So maybe you are on the starting block and you're getting ready to run a race, right? Or you're about to dive in and swim. You haven't exerted yourself at all yet, right? You're not at your muscles don't actually need more oxygen at the exact moment. But the brain knows that we are about to sprint. And so we're anticipating it, and there's this external signal coming from the brain that's telling the heart to speed up because uh, we are going to soon need more oxygen. And so in anticipation of that, we're trying to flood the system uh, ahead of time, all right? So this is a feed-forward feed control. Yes, ma'am. Would that, I guess, the, the conflict and stuff of those two homeostasis uh, um, have been disrupted if... Those are cool comic books. I want to read one. Um, like, for example, if someone's cryogenically frozen... Oh, wow, yeah. Um, like, they have to make sure homeostasis is stable or whatever. Mm -hmm. But would... That could, I mean, cold weather and temperature, does that affect homeostasis? Oh. Like if someone's freezing to death, is that Ooh. one factor that like, they could disrupt? Yes. You just hold on to that because that is like the perfect introduction for the next slide. Oscar, your question before I move on. You, you, you kind of raised your hand there. No? no nothing. Anyone else? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, beautiful. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Um, so here is an example of homeostasis and, th and thermal regulation, which is what you're talking about. And thermal regulation is an example of negative feedback. Um, so remember, when I said negative feedback, that is an instance where the effector, the action of the effector, opposes whatever change we're noticing in the variable. All right. So let's see how it works uh, for this. Um, in, in the, in the analogy we're going to use is the way temperature works in your house, all right, at home, probably not in your dorm. But uh, in, in, when you're at home, there is a thermostat on the wall, and you set the temperature that you want the, the house to be at. Maybe you want it at 24 degrees centigrade, all right? You, so you dial it in to the thermostat, and uh, there's some sort of receptor, which is a thermometer in the house, and it monitors what the temperature is. It compares that temperature, that reading, to the set point. Is it colder in the house than the set point? <clears throat> well, uh, the integration center, which is the tiny little chip in the thermometer, 
uh, says, okay, the thermometer reading is below my set point. When that happens, I send a signal to kick on the furnace. The furnace is the effector. It's going to cause an effect that is opposite to the change uh, in the regulated variable. So the temperature is dropping. The, uh, the, thermo the thermostat notices that and kicks on the heater, and the heater is going to bring the temperature back up again. All right? And so the temperature goes up. The temperature goes up. But it gets to a point where uh, the comparison between the thermometer, which is going up and down, and the set point, it's above now. The temperature is going up. And the thermostat says, whoa, 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 whoa. So um, the temperature is rising above it. And the little logic circuit says, OK, we're going to turn off the furnace. So whatever the uh, effector is, it's going to the, the outcome is going to oppose the change in the stimulus. So that rising temperature will plateau and then begin to cool again. All right, and so the temperature in your room oscillates by a few degrees around the set point that you set. So maybe you set, uh, what is it, I got 22 degrees here. So maybe it's 21 and 23 degrees or, you know, 21 and a half and 22 and a half. Somewhere in there, the temperature is, is oscillating. The same thing happens in your brain. Um, there is this thermoregulatory center in the brain that um, is the integration center for temperature in the body. And um, the receptors, the sensory information, are these thermoreceptors in the skin uh, and in the hypothalamus, which is part of your brain. Um, so there are, there are all kinds of sensory neurons in your whole body that are monitoring your temperature. And they're sending information back to this thermal regulatory center in the brain. And that thermal regulatory center in the brain has in it an, an innate set point, what it thinks our body's temperature should be. Okay? Um, and so based upon the comparison of that sensory information to the inherent set point in the brain, it's going to have different output. It's going to stimulate different effectors in the brain. So uh, what are these effectors? Well, they can be sweat glands in the skin. Um, they can be blood vessels in the skin. Uh, so for example, um, Say we get too hot, and the thermoregulatory system is going to send out signals to the sweat glands to start producing sweat, which will evaporate, and as it evaporates from your skin, it cools you down. Uh, it will cause the blood vessels <clears throat> in the periphery of your skin to dilate, bringing blood to the surface, causing us to get flush and red when we're hot so we can radiate off some of the heat that our blood uh, is storing. On the other hand, say we're really cold, and uh, the comparison of the sensory receptors to the set point in the brain is telling us that, oh, geez, we're getting a little bit chilly. Uh, so what happens? We start shivering. We start shivering. And by shivering, we're actually doing muscular contractions we're burning energy and creating heat as we do that. That's one of our body's ways of trying to warm up. Because even though you may be sitting there in late November on the bleacher watching the football team uh, kick Bowden's butt, and you're happy sitting there, your body's like, it is cold out here. Start shivering. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you guys, do you guys go to the football games? I haven't yet this year either. I don't really a football fan, but huh? They are great kids. I've met a number of them. They're great kids. What do you want out of a football team, honestly? Do you want guys that are a great team that like 
are wonderful students. They're a boon to have on campus. They represent like the character of the school, or like dudes that always win no matter what. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can't have them both. That would be nice. Uh, have they not won a single game yet? Oh man. Yeah. Oh. Did you go? Oh yeah. Oscar. So I saw I saw a movie where like there was like people um uh, like there was a person walking in like really super cold weather like like I think like maybe negative okay and so they had like no uh, no shoes on in the snow and like not really like jacket so like. They breathed in, and their lungs broke. Oh my god. And like... Where? Where were they? Movie. Oh yeah, that sounds implausible. It's not, it's not possible? For like that their lungs to freeze? I don't know, you'd have to be somewhere like really the, cold. I think it was like, yeah, it was like, it was like negative degree weather. Yeah. And like, it was like, the, the like air froze, I think, like, the, like, fluid, so like, it froze, and when they tried to breathe, it like kind of broke, so it like punctured the like lung. That sounds so implausible like, to me. Blood, so it's not possible. That sounds. They would have. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. And he's he's asking me if something in a movie was 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 possible, and I'm I'm reserving extreme skepticism for that story. But maybe I don't know. Wind River. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. It sounds sounds pretty implausible. But uh, on, on Stewart's question about uh, going into like homeostatic deep freeze or something like that. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, so that like suspended animation sort of thing. That the idea there is that you just shut it all down, you send the cells into this quiescent, uh, metabolically inert, but not, um, not uh, dead state. Mm -hmm. So. I feel like you can freeze someone like that, you can freeze them back. Yeah, well, you know, I don't, <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, like actually. Cryogenic. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a cryogenic expert, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but um, I, I think it's possible uh, in your lifetimes, at least, if not mine. Let's see, who knows? Maybe that would be a good strategy for getting out of the predicament our world is in at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Solar powered thing. I don't know. Okay, let's get back to uh, negative feedback. So, how, what does this have to do with yoga? Dear God. Dr. K. Well, look at here's an example. There are many. Um, so, an example of negative feedback is postural change in blood pressure. Say you are doing uh, Uttanasana, this like forward bend, and you are down there uh, for a while, and the head rushes, the blood rushes to your head, and you kind of stabilize. You're like, oh yeah, deep release here. This feels great. Uh, the, the blood is going to um, sort of pool to the head, uh, but then you stand up rapidly. Has this ever happened to any of you? And whew, whew, everything starts going a little gray maybe if you get up too quick. Yeah, this is because the blood drains from your upper body, and it's going to cause a homeostatic imbalance. The blood pressure in your head where your brain is, Remember I said our bodies are basically complex, fleshy spacesuits for this giant gray worm that is us. Um, your brain needs the blood pressure up, and when it drops, uh, the brain is not happy. So uh, there are what are called baroreceptors. Baro, uh, like the word barometer. What is a barometer? Pressure, yeah. Yeah, it tells you atmospheric pressure, so a barometer. 
A baroreceptor is a pressure receptor. It's monitoring the pressure of blood in your, your body. These baroreceptors that are above the heart. So they're in the carotid arch. This is uh, called the carotid, uh, pardon me, the carotid bulb and the aortic arch. This is the aortic arch. That's the aorta. Aortic arch, and this is the carotid, the common and uh, internal and external carotid. There's these, this thing called the carotid bulb, uh, which we will talk about more um, later in the semester when I talk about the effects of pranayama and blah, blah, blah. But there's, there's these baroreceptors right here that monitor uh, blood pressure. They send a signal upstairs to the brain that says, uh-oh, uh-oh, blood pressure dropping. The, uh, uh, the cardioregulatory center of the brain stem says, okay, well, let's kick it up a notch. And it puts it into second or third gear and sends a signal down to the, um, the heart. And it begins accelerating the heartbeat, all right? And as soon as the heartbeat accelerates, it brings the blood pressure back up to where it's normally supposed to be. That's why when you, you come up, you go gray for a second, uh, but then you kind of return. And as if you were to have a heart rate monitor on yourself, when you did that, maybe we will do that. That'll be fun. Let's try it. We'll maybe do that in lab. Yeah. We'll do it in lab during the heart rate pranayama lab. Uh, you can see the, the increase in your heart rate. All right. So that's a homeostatic system, a negative feedback system. The blood pressure is dropping. The body responds to do something that brings the heart rate back up. Cool. So this, um, has anyone got a grandparent or an elderly person in their family that has fallen uh, before? Because they were, maybe they got dizzy. <clears throat> the vast majority of falls sustained by elderly people happen first thing in the morning when they get out of bed. When they get out of bed. Because they've been laying down all night uh, and the blood has kind of come up up here, right? Because they're all, everything's equal. And then they sit up and the blood drains from their head. Uh, but the uh, blood vessels here are not as responsive as they used to be when they were young. Maybe it's because they're a little bit lined with all those uh, bacon cheeseburgers over the years or whatever. Um, and uh, as such, they don't respond as quickly. They don't respond as quickly. The homeostatic system is not as uh, tuned as it is. And so they get really dizzy and then boom. They go down. Yes, Priya. Yeah. Sure. One thing about this class, I am always loath to dispense medical uh, diagnosis or um, advice because I am not uh, a physician. I am certainly not your physician. Um, so I, I don't, I don't want to like specifically answer that question, but you know, it's a pretty common thing for all people, regardless of age. Um, and yes, it can be associated with people who have lower uh, than typical blood pressure. Maybe they'll have head rushes a little bit more uh, readily than others. Does that answer? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really sure what's going on, but could be. Yes. So, Yeah, what happens in Parkinson's disease is uh, a death of cells in the brainstem called the striata negra. Okay. And it's, um, uh, it is uh, tissue of the brain that is responsible for intentional motion. Um, so you'll notice a lot of times that people with Parkinson's, when they go to pick something up, they'll see it there and they go like this. 
right? So as they get closer to the, like they start out nice and smooth, and as they get closer, they, they, they're having a hard time uh, getting in on it. Uh, that's because they have, it's not a, a balance thing so much, uh, or blood pressure thing, like it's not a vestibular cochlear, it's uh, a skeletal muscular thing uh, in terms of, of connecting muscle firing to your free will, the like in the part of your brain that is you, or not hopefully you, but some person that has Parkinson's and the intention to do, to carry out that action, right? Because there's parts of the brain that are going to get you to pick something up, and then there are parts of the brain that are telling the parts of the brain to pick that thing up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right? And it's that part of the brain, the striatum nigrum, that, uh, nigra, that are uh, dying, yeah, in those people. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, on to positive feedback. The self-amplifying cycle. So this is different than negative feedback. In positive feedback, the response of the effector is going to increase the change that we uh, notice in the variable. <clears throat> so this is going to move us away from that stable internal environment, all right? It's going to move us away. It is a regulatory control system. It's uh, positive feedback. <clears throat> but it's going to be moving us away from a normal state of homeostasis. Does that make sense? Uh, and the normal range, what, where our body typically is, is lost. Uh, this, but that's not to say that this is not a normal process. Positive feedback can be a normal process, uh, but it's a normal way of producing rapid changes. So here's an example. Uh, hemostasis, that's getting a cut and your butt blood clotting, all right? Uh, you get a cut, it's great that you clot, because if you didn't, that's called hemophilia, and that's a real problem for those people. Yep, platelets. So we get a, we get a cut, a break in a blood vessel, uh, those damaged cells that were were cut when we uh, that were damaged when we got the cut, uh, they start releasing chemicals. Those chemicals start really one of the most profoundly complicated molecular cascades uh, in the body. A whole series of like you've seen those crazy dominoes things that go on for ten minutes. It's like that. Clotting is super complicated. Um, and this is obviously an extreme simplification. Uh, and there's additional chemicals that get released that speeds up the clotting. So as, more cl as clotting begins, the body takes cues from that that make more clotting happen. And, it, and it, uh, it's like a set of dominoes that gets triggered by the initial event. And then it is a self-amplifying cycle. All right? Positive feedback. So whatever... The, whatever the uh, stimulus is, the sensory input, it's going to speed up uh, the effector that's causing that, uh, that change. Positive feedback, all right? So it's kind of like, uh, I, I like to think of it like this. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dad, you know, I got a couple kids, and they're the kids, um, they're like sitting there on the couch, happily reading their books or whatever I wish and they're on the they're on the couch reading and then next thing you know they're kind of getting bored and like one of them like whacks the other one with their book right and then they're like a whack comes back on the other side and there's like some whacking going on and I say hey cut it out stop whacking each other with the books would you I'm like giving some negative feedback that's not it's not good you're not acting well right and so I'm like opposing the stimulus, you know, with like the change, and I'm bringing them back to homeostasis. <laughs> Whereas um, maybe they were, yeah, they were just like sitting on the couch, bored, staring out the window, like <laughs> messing with the dog or whatever. And and then like, oh, okay, and they sit up and they start reading a book. And I'm like, oh yeah. That's good. Do some more of that. That's it. That's the way. You know, be the change in the world. 
And like, oh, okay. And they start reading more and more and more. And so I'm giving them positive feedback and I'm increasing their, um, their, you, you guys get it here if I, if I beat it to death. All right, so here's some other examples uh, of positive feedback. So contractions during childbirth. I think I have a slide after this that shows that. Uh, protein digestion, when you eat some food. Uh, actually digesting protein, as you begin to digest protein, those broken down peptides amplify the speed with which you break other proteins down. It's a self-speeding uh, process, or like the contraction, we'll see contractions in a minute. Uh, fever, when you're, when you're having a fever, your body temperature goes up, and as it goes up, it speeds itself up, so it continues uh, to go up. That, there's examples of positive feedback there. Ovulation, the process whereby your ovary uh, releases an egg into the fallopian tube. Uh, that is a positive feedback. Lactation, uh, producing milk. When, once there is a little bit of milk let down, that causes more and more rapid change in the production of milk uh, when the baby is, is feeding. Uh, not to leave the men out, ejaculation is an example of, of positive feedback. Right? We know it's positive. So generation of nerve signals, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, that is another example of positive feedback, all right? So there's a, there's a bunch of times when we need to like speed some rapid change up. Uh, let's, let's just uh, to go through uh, childbirth a little bit. So in uh, an example here, uh, step one, uh, the baby is, is ready to come out and greet the world such as it is, and its head starts to push on uh, the cervix at the, at the mouth of the birth canal. And that pressure, there, there are um, sensory receptors in the cervix that say, whoop, hello, something's happening down there. That's not just, that's not just uh, yesterday's lunch. That is something's happening. Uh, nerve impulses uh, tell the brain that uh, the baby is moving into the birth canal. The brain then goes through a whole bunch of processing and sends a signal to what's called the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland produces the good stuff, the oxytocin. Oxytocin is uh, a lovely molecule um, that... Uh, is going to st uh, stimulate, in this case, it does a number of different things, uh, but oxytocin, in this case, um, one of the effects is to cause the, um, the uterus to contract, right? Like the uterus is this, it's like the, the mother of all organs in the body. It's amazing, it really is. Uh, super, super strong organ that, uh, Lamps down on that body and shoves that football through that tiny little <laughs> that tiny little cervix there. Uh, one of the other effects of oxytocin is that it it uh, to uh, some extent mitigates pain, right? So the woman who is having child, I'm not going to say it's not painful. I never went through it. I have witnessed it in great detail, but um, <laughs> but. Uh, it, it, it certainly is, 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 can be painful, but it is the, the woman herself is not, uh, I'll say, they, definitely outside of the norm. Definitely outside of the norm. Not like feeling pain in the same way you might uh, in a normal situation, right? So the oxytocin is sort of the, the master hormone that is uh, managing all of these uh, various things that are happening. But as the head pushes more on the cervix, we get a bigger uh, signal going to the brain, more oxytocin, harder contractions. Uh, has anybody been around when they're, uh, besides your own birth, uh, for the birth of one of your sisters when your mom or had, yeah. Um, so you, you may, if you were there, uh, we had a home birth. My kids were born at home. I was there for all of it. Um, those contractions speed up, don't they? They speed up. They start uh, very infrequently, maybe every... Uh, five minutes, and then three minutes, and then two minutes, and then it's like pretty soon, and it's just like one big contraction, right? It's speeding up, and that's and that's what we see here: positive feedback. 
Yeah. Yeah, you're getting it. Faster and faster. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So that pituitary gland is just cranking out the oxytocin. Um, so I just threw this in here so it wasn't a completely gratuitous slide. Uh, uh, so it did relate to uh, yoga. Um, yeah, pre and, and this is also for tonight, right? Because you're going to see Mari. I'm not sure that she is especially an expert on prenatal yoga or not, but she is pregnant. And she's going to be doing some yoga with you. So, And she's a naturopathic doctor. This is an excellent opportunity to ask her some questions. She is open to any of that. So you have any questions, please, please, please ask her. She would be uh, delighted. She's a naturopath. Yeah, so she has a naturopathic. So... Uh, Naturopath, excellent question for Mari. She will give you a better answer than I will. But uh, there is allopath, osteopath, and naturopath. Those are, yeah, you, you've probably heard of uh, osteopath before, right? And then there's homeopath, yeah. And I think uh, homeopathic uh, medicine falls within the uh, broader realm of naturopathic medicine. Yeah, I don't know what her take on homeopathic medicine is. Um, yeah, I, I, my mind is not closed on it, but I am. I have scientific skepticism about uh, homeopathy. But um, yeah, so naturopath, allopath is like a, a standard doctor that you would go to that is going to treat you with pharmaceuticals and surgery and, and that sort of thing. Uh, a naturopathic doctor is looking is more a holistic look at uh, your, you as a complete person, your health and well-being, and trying to not just treat symptoms, it's trying to treat the whole person, uh, hopefully using medicines that are a little bit more naturally based than pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. So, so get, you talk to her about it. She is like the person. That's why we're bringing her in. Uh, but she'll talk about yoga. Anyways, I will talk a little bit about uh, pregnancy and yoga at some other points in the semester. Probably when I talk about fascia, there's some interesting relationships between uh, fascia, fascial planes, and the SI joint and how the pelvis changes during pregnancy. Uh, but the, the point is prenatal yoga can have numerous aspects, numerous effects on both your pregnancy and actual childbirth. So for example, ujjayi breath uh, during the actual process of uh, ujjayi breath during the actual process of um, giving birth it, um, can greatly facilitate uh, that, that process. Anyways, um, and this is the last slide on uh, this thing here. So when we talk about homeostasis, one of the things that you may... Um, I, I moved on before I asked further questions. Are there any questions? Save your, uh, any, any deeper questions maybe for Mari. I'll help, I'll help her if you ask her anything too hard. Uh, but, and um, communication is essential in a homeostatic system. So there, there are two types of communication. Uh, there's the electrical communication that's done by the nervous system, and then there's chemical communication. And this is mediated by the endocrine system. Uh, here's the way this works. We have some neuron. There's information coming in through the dendrites into a neuron. It processes it through scientific magic. And then it sends uh, the impulse out through the axon uh, to the telodendria, out to the synapses of whatever the target cell is. We, were, we saw that in the neural <coughs> kazoo height. In the neuromuscular junction, didn't we? In this diagram, we have these neurotransmitters here, and this and maybe these are muscle be muscle cells, but they don't have to be. Uh, these cells could be, can be, they can actually be endocrine cells. There are places where the nervous system and the endocrine system are going to interact. Uh, and then on the other side, we're going to have some endocrine tissue. There's endocrine cells. And they're going to produce 
some sort of chemical, a hormone that goes into the blood, gets transported through the whole system, and is going to have an effect on whatever the target cell is. So oxytocin, yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. That's right. It can be positive or negative feedback, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've we've sort of left positive and negative behind. Okay. Um, and one of the things about I, I I had a bunch of slides exploring this a little bit more, but I cut them out to kind of simplify it for you guys. Um, but one of the things is uh, in, in endocrine control, it tends to be a, a kind of control system where there are multiple targets. So we said in childbirth, uh, oxytocin is affecting the uterus, right? But not just the uterus. It's affecting other parts of the body. For example, your response to pain, uh, the the uh, microvasculature in the body. It causes changes in that, right? It's going to cause changes in the muscles and the, and the fascia that's controlling the SI joint, uh, which is the architecture of the pelvis as that big baby is passing uh, down that, um, that birth canal. It's pretty far out stuff, man. It's pretty far out stuff. Uh, yoga can have effects on both the nervous system and the endocrine system, okay? And it's my highest aspiration. We're going we're gonna to eventually get caught up in the, next, in, the, in the coming lectures with a lot of musculoskeletal stuff because that's the sort of the easiest way to point your finger and, says, well, and say yoga affects this because it does. It's very clear how yoga affects the musculoskeletal system. But it's my aspiration given you know, how much material I can get through to be able to talk about, about this stuff here, the, the like effects of yoga on the control systems. Because this is kind of what's interesting, right? I mean, this is like how yoga affects anxiety and depression and can affect stress hormones in the body and inflammation, all those, all those kinds of things, all right? And so that, this is where yoga has those effects, okay? Yeah, questions? Oh, no, nobody? All right, so that's the end of that one. Um, I am just going to start right on this one. I'm only going to get through a couple slides, but I got 10 minutes, and I don't want to waste them because we're already – I meant to have covered this stuff uh, several lectures ago, so I'm just going to dive right into it. Oh, yeah, it should be. Do I not have uh, – Number three on there? Oh, I don't have ET and CT on there? Okay, well, I'll post it after class. I'm only going to get through a couple slides. Um, all right. So un unless you would rather ask me questions in some sort of review way. No, just go on. Cool. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, about 50 trillion cells in your body. Whoa, the mind boggles. That is a whole lot. 50 trillion. Let's think about that. That is a 5 with um, 12, 13 zeros after it, something like that. That's a lot. Maybe even more than that after. Yeah, 50 trillion cells. But there's only 200 cell types. Still a lot, but uh, 50 trillion is a big number. So a couple definitions. A tissue, so we're still climbing that ladder, right? We're climbing that ladder of life. Um, uh, tissues are collections of cells and cell products that are going to perform specific but limited function. There's a, a, a very specific function that a, a tissue is going to uh, perform, and uh, it is limited. An organ is some kind of structure that can be made up of multiple tissue types. Uh, it's going to have discrete boundaries. You can point to its boundaries, its margins. That is an organ. Um, so uh, the body has four 
basic tissue types. 200 cell types spread across the four tissue types. Those four tissue types are broken into two categories, non-excitable and excitable tissues. Okay? So the non-excitable tissue is what we're going to talk about first. And then we'll move on to the excitable tissues. Non-excitable tissues are epithelial tissues, which I'm not really going to talk about at all hardly with you. I might show you one slide about epithelium. You like epithelium? You do? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. We're all coated. But... Uh, the other type is connective tissue, and there's a lot of different types of connective tissue. So I have some examples there. There's ciliated columnar epithelium and loose connective tissue, areolar tissue. Uh, we've seen areolar tissue in, in lab, haven't we? Uh, so epithelium covers exposed surfaces, uh, passageways, and also can form glands. So that your whole body, anything that is open an open area, right? So your skin, your nasal passages, down into your lungs, uh, down your throat, into your stomach, through your whole GI tract, and out your anus, all covered in epithelium. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, up your urethra, into your bladder, up your ureters, into your kidneys, through the convoluted tubules of your nephrons, all coated in uh, epithelium. Uh, up the mammary glands and into all those glands there, uh, coated in epithelium, through your GI tract, up the pancreatic duct, into the, uh, the glands of the pancreas. Line, all of that is lined with epithelium. All right, uh, Through the common bile duct, up into the gallbladder, all lined with epithelium. All right, epithelium covers surfaces. It covers surfaces. Inside the heart, in the lining of the heart, covered in epithelium. Uh, the, the cavity inside your abdomen, all lined with epithelium. Makes glands and covers any exposed surface or internal passageway. Uh, next is connective tissue. So... The name is pretty descriptive. It's going to fill internal spaces, but there are a few other uh, categories. There is supportive connective tissue, uh, which we will talk about. There's two types, bone and cartilage. Uh, there is uh, fluid connective tissue. This is basically blood and white blood cells. Um, and connective tissue uh, can also be adipose tissue that stores uh, energy in the form of fat. So that's connective tissue, and we'll, we'll talk about that only as it applies to what we're doing here, okay? And then excitable tissue, there's two types, neural and muscle. That's it. If it's an excitable tissue, it's got to be some kind of a neuron or some kind of a muscle cell. And these are cells that can be excited, and this doesn't mean happy or something like that, uh, enthusiastic. It means that they can go through what's called an action potential, all right? And I haven't fully decided how much we're going to talk about action potentials, but I kind of feel like we need to so you understand how muscles work a little bit. It's not going to be too intense. So neural tissue, these are the electrical signals from one part of the body to another. And then muscle tissue, uh, it's contractile tissue, right? Um, contractile tissue. So that's skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle that is in you know, like your blood vessels and stuff. Okay. Oh, it's it's an act. They both go through an action potential. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't worry about that. Yeah, you can write that down, but we'll actually talk about that uh, at a later date. Um, okay. So here is an outline of of all of it, of all of the tissue types. Uh, in the body. Actually, it's pretty abbreviated. It's not, it's not quite all of it, uh, but it's, it covers all and more than we're going to talk about. Um, so I'm just showing you this today. No, I didn't. Um, so 
Uh, I told you in epithelium, there are epithelial cells and glandular cells, right? So this is the covering stuff, and it can also make glands. Um, and there are, there are different types of uh, epithelial proper, and there's two types of glands that the, bodies, the body makes. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm saying it just because I'm being comprehensive and covering all this, but this is not uh, something that is especially relevant to what we're going to be talking about. Uh, then in connective tissue, um, there is connective tissue proper, fluid connective tissue, and supportive connective tissue. We'll be talking about a number of different types of connective tissue. Um, in the connective tissue proper, they can be dense and loose. You've already seen a couple of these categories in the lab. Um, I've shown you dense <coughs> regular, uh, and I've shown you areolar, and I've shown you adipose tissue. Again, those were shown to you because they're pretty much the only ones we're actually going to be talking about. Um, fluid connective tissue, like I said, this is your, your blood. So this is the plasma, interstitial fluid, and the lymph in your body. These are this is like the fluid stuff that makes you up. And then supportive connective tissue is cartilage and bone. Cartilage, uh, there's three types of cartilage. Hyaline cartilage, elastic, and fibrocartilage. cartilage. Um, I have, we are going to talk about hyaline and fibrocartilage. I'm probably not going to talk about elastic cartilage, although there are places in the body that elastic cartilage is affected by yoga. Yes, Sophia. Um, I have a hard understanding of cartilage because it's between the vertebrae. Mm -hmm. Yep, the vertebral discs. And the hyaline is like the ribs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then the rest of this, uh, I'm going to talk about the, what are called tissue membranes because I need to talk about synovium. I'm not going to talk about these others, but I will talk about synovial membranes. And then this is muscle and neural tissue that we'll get to much later. Yeah? So the only ones that we need to be able to recognize in the slides are areolar, adipose, dense, regular, and hyaline, and fibrocartilage. That's right. And bone. I showed you a slide of bone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's right. I mean, whatever it said on the, yeah, but that sounds like that's about it. Yeah, because I didn't give you any ET. Uh, those were the CTs I gave you. Yeah, bone, hyaline, fibro, uh, areolar, adipose, and dense, regular. Yeah. Yep. And then I didn't give you any the excitable tissues. 